and uh, we have a procedural uh, matter to address some uh, once the witness is in and before we continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Council, before we proceed, I just want to make a procedural uh, intervention here. Uh, Bishop Odiko has got um, uh, 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 an issue to address um, to the Commission, if we can just allow him to do that. Bishop, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, chairman and fellow Commissioners and uh, Councils. Um, the topic that is to be discussed from now on, um, uh, most of it, I am closely connected with them as um, uh, the chairman of the Gambia Christian Council. And uh, because of that, I would want to ask with the permission of the chairman to recuse myself from this moment on this particular topic. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Commissioner Odeco. Uh, notice taken of your request. Uh, Pursue one to, uh, to the relevant um, uh, provisions of the Act, the Code of Conduct and the Rules of Procedure of the Commission, and uh, you are granted them um, a recusal um, as you as requested. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed for your understanding. Thank you. Uh, Council, shall we continue? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome back, Mr. Witness. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, may I remind you that you're still on the oath? Yes, I do. Uh, yes, so uh, let us continue. Um, with the list of issues for, for discussion. Uh, I'll now call them in, in, a, in an order that is different from, from the list that you have provided. Okay. Um, yes, so uh, let's now talk about the police-imposed ban on drumming, music, and dance during Ramadan. This was be imposed onto the Christian community by the Gambia Police Force. We have instances where church activities we have been interrupted, Fajikunda in particular. They were having a church cantata inside the church compound and the church police decided to go in and interrupt them. Of course, most of the parishioners involved at that time were youths, so they took their stand and refused to stop. They went up to the high authorities with the police, and then eventually they were allowed to continue after a long delay going in and out and calling senior police officers. Still, the police continued with those harassment going inside the community, inside compounds, because they were celebrating a religious activity. Their children were receiving a sacrament in the church, and immediately after the sacrament, they would go home to celebrate it. They chased them up in their different communities, stopping them from dancing, from drumming, from playing music. And this also further went into members of the community that we are not um, in a joyous mood as such, like uh, s celebrating a sorrowful event. It is not unusual that 
some of our tribal groups here. They celebrate the death of an elderly and respectable person. And the celebration involves the drumming. They went into all these homes. They extended it up to New Jerusalem and stopped these people from celebrating the death of an elderly person in their community. This were harassment onto the Christian community and people suffered. Some who resisted it had to go and call for reinforcement, for help outside to come and help them from this um, police. The police was even queried that they had no right to implement a law here, that they were not lawmakers, that the law didn't come from the National Assembly. They were to implement, not to make laws, because they said the ban came from the police. Thank you. Uh, and of course, you hit on the matter. Uh, did the Inspector General of Police explain under what authority he or she, well, invariably, at least in the past, they've always been he, uh, did he explain under what authority he imposed that ban? The narrative given was it was an executive order. And at that time, we all knew where executive orders were coming from. But, uh, but uh, ex executive orders, <coughs> excuse me, were they published or not published? They were published. There is a ban. Uh, did, did you ever see uh, the publication of that executive order? Yes. Banning drumming? I do. During there was a ban on drums which was published. Have you found it? Not yet. I was sharing it yeah, with okay. yes, it, the office it. there. Okay. Um, Have we you got it? Take a look at page 99 of your book. Exhibit 116. Is that helpful? Page 99. I've seen that, but I'm looking for the ban mm -hmm. itself on her tie. Mm -hmm. Now this... You're looking for the actual document. That's right. But here, mm -hmm. as I reported here, mm -hmm. it was in the Daily Observer mm -hmm. of 8 June 2016. Mm -hmm. I was looking for it here. Mm -hmm. But it was reported on the Daily Observer. Mm -hmm. um, this 8 June publication of the ban mm -hmm. in the local newspaper and GRTS read, and I quote, as the, um, as the Muslim Uma is observing the holy month of Ramadan, mm -hmm. the Office of the Inspector General of Police, in honor of the holy month, is hereby informing the general public that all ceremonies, festivities, and programs that involve drumming, music, and dance during the day at night or at night are prohibited. So this was a publication, yes? Yes, and uh, uh, in fact, it uh, went uh, on to say 
that all those engaged in the practice are therefore warned to desist from such activities, otherwise they will be eventually apprehended and face the full force of the law without compromise. Mm -hmm. The Inspector General of Police is hereby advising the general public to report any such persons or groups to the police as stern action will be taken against those found wanting of violations. Uh, so, unquote, that was the publication. We created more disturbance in Gambian community now you want a neighbor to go and spy on a neighbor and go and report to the police. This was all that it created. Amongst neighbors that lived in harmony, now somebody is inviting them to go and report. It was not helpful in Gambian community. Uh, having lived in Gambia for a very long time, have you ever witnessed real, actual drumming and dancing in the streets as we would normally have it for traditional purposes, as per our traditional customs? Yes, drumming. During Ramadan, have you ever seen it happen? Yes, I have seen that. I have seen that, yes. Uh, would, you, would you say that it is part of the exercise of the power under the public order rubric to proscribe that activity for purposes of public order. I mean, I don't mean religious service. I mean open drumming and dancing uh, in public during Ramadan. As I said, dancing during Ramadan in Gambian community was not shown at, no, nobody bothered whether you were dancing or not. Whether, nobody used to bother even whether you are eating or not, you are observing the Ramadan or not. Gambians used to look at it as a personal thing, you and your religion. You want to fast, you fast. You don't want to fast, you eat, you eat. And nobody shuns at you. You have an occasion to dance, you dance. The only thing that I can add on to that is that, yes, if it involves a sad um, event, like a funeral, I have a joyous event to celebrate, a need for me to dance, a next door neighbor has a sad event, it would not be unusual to see those with the joyous event just postponed. You don't have to call the police. They show good respect to the neighbor and they will postpone the dancing or even have their event without beating a drum, make it celebrate it what they call very low profile. This was the norm. Not for the police to go and enter and say, don't do this, don't do that, report A and report B. It used never to involve the police. Uh, 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 what I am trying to drive at here is the rationale behind this ban. Because normally when we celebrate our marriages, our weddings, and so forth, we do have what is called sabar. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, or our Bukarabus or whatever. Mm -hmm. And those used to happen in public. And there's open dancing and, uh, but those would not normally happen during Ramadan, would they? In public, out in the street dancing, maybe not. Maybe also because the people who might be beating the drum are themselves fasting. So you might not see it in public, but it would happen, and it used to happen, and in private homes it used to happen. People who have cause to drum would drum, and people, even inside Ramadan, you know that you have cause to beat a drum, you would beat a drum. Uh, 
but uh, for Muslims generally, um, they don't indulge in, generally they don't indulge in drumming and open dancing in public during Ramadan. Yes, as I said, okay. the, the, the Muslim who is fasting may not do it during Ramadan. He has something else to think about. But, but have you ever encountered a situation where we have had this ban before, before this particular occasion, uh, in on Wednesday, the eighth of June. Which, uh, Never before. Uh, that was the 20, first time we had the ban. This that, was the first. That, that time was that the first happened. time I encountered with the ban. Oh, okay. And I even I, I can remember before putting that on paper, I consulted with people who were much more my elders, my seniors in society to ask them whether they have heard of this before. And they all declined. They've never heard of it before. Uh, but as far as you are concerned, uh, whatever may have been the motive for, the, um, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for placing the ban, its implementation affected the exercise of the religious rights of the Christians. It did. And, uh, what did you do? What steps did you take to, to stop the implementation of this ban? Um, delegations were sent. Letters were written. I think these were the two actions taken. Delegation to the Inspector General. And um, letters to the Inspector General. And they received it. And some communities even went on their own to see. This was not organized by the church, but different Christian communities sent their delegation to the Inspector General. And some were able to get negotiation with the Inspector General to permit them to carry on. And uh, uh, from the reports, uh, on Thursday, 9th June, which is the following day after the press release notifying the ban, uh, the Christian community stated that a team of pastors representing the Christian community had visited the office of the IGP to seek clarification on the press release prohibiting all ceremonies, festivities, and programs that involve drumming, music, and dance during the day or at night. And the release stated that the Office of the Inspector General of Police clarified that, clarified that the release in no way intended to affect Christian worship. So Christians are free to worship throughout the country, assuring that normal Christian events may continue as normal. The Christian community has come under some criticism as some activists are not impressed that a coalition can be formed to address the ban on drumming and not jam a strip to wipe out mandinkas." Unquote. Uh, would you agree that on the next day, an exemption was given for Christian worship? Yes, to a group who applied pressure, who sent a delegation because they had feast being anticipated and drumming being uh, anticipated. They went in and negotiated and they, they got exemption. Some were exempted after negotiation with the police. Some uh, never had the opportunity to negotiate. Some never bothered to negotiate. Some ran from the police. And the harassment, even after the explanation that uh, those homes were exempted, it still continued. It uh, continued up to the end of Ramadan. Were any steps taken to avert that harassment, as far as you know? No, apart from these two um, actions which I have listed, I'm not aware of any other. In a sense, what you're telling us is that 
even though the Inspector General of Police clarified that the ban did not extend to Christian worship, the harassment still continued. Exactly. Uh, was any steps taken to notify the public that this ban does not extend to Christian worship? I said there was an explanation from the Inspector General that Christian homes were exempted, that the ban w would be applied only in public places and markets. Uh, yes, that was there. But in effect, they continued going into homes inside the community. What I am trying to drive at is whether this clarification was only given in private during a meeting between Christi members of the Christian community who protested or challenged the authority? Or was it made publicly for everyone to be aware? Was it publicized just, just like the ban was publicized? I was not aware of that. In fact, the people who got that explanation from the police, we engaged them. And they repeated the explanation given by the police. And uh, your com one of your complaints is that not, was, not only was the ban unlawful, unconstitutional, because it circumscribed the exercise of your religious freedom, but also it was ultra-virus. The person who made the ban did not have authority to make the ban. Those are the two points I'm making. Exactly. Right. You are correct. Um, but, so um, let us now proceed. And, but then uh, perhaps maybe to take it a little further, those who were arrested for allegedly violating the ban, were they ever prosecuted? No. They would be taken to police and then some other elders from the Christian community would find their way of getting them out. One way was to get a senior police officer to intervene. And in many instances, when you have that sort of intervention, they got themselves freed. Is it possible, well, the IGP at that time is easily identifiable, I, I, I would imagine. But is it possible to put together a list of unlawful interventions in the exercise of your religious freedoms that we are made possible to this ban? Say, for instance, to put together a list of homes that, were, uh, that, that, that the police went into in order to try to inf enforce this ban. Could the Christian community put that together? Maybe they, they can put that together. But for me, when writing this one, I got some examples which I personally visited. Could you, could you give them, could you provide those examples? There was one in old, um, new, that's New Year's one, where a Manjago tribe was celebrating the death of an elderly woman in their clan. That celebration involved drumming. The police came in and everybody was worried because they knew there was this ban and they were coming to implement it. They came in and ordered the music to be stopped. Other group of people shouted from yonder, we're not going to stop, we're not going to obey this order. But they stopped for some time. They walked out, that's the place walked out. We did believe that everything is in order, they have stopped it. Immediately they left, they gradually got it again, and the drumming continued. Of course, there was a long period when they stopped 
this. There was an other one which, this is a community, an other one which St. Charles Luanga youths were stopped by the police. And the where were they stopped? Because of playing music. Uh, was in it the, in the church compound? Okay. Right. Again, to they resisted. The police insisted, and the youths resisted. And some youths who were from Muslim homes, I must say, supported the Christian youths who had their activity inside the church. And together, they called a senior police officer who was attending to an event at Senegambia, one Senegambia Beach Hotel. They had to go to him because that was the technique being used. Look for a senior police officer. And that person also had some companions from that activity from Senegambia and came in to the rescue of the Faji Kunda community. It took a long time, but at the end of the day, they continued their function. These were all harassment. But, but of course, you would agree with me that uh, in the exercise of religious freedoms, sometimes there is the need for moderation and mutual accommodation. You would agree with that? Sure, at all times, yes. Yes, and, uh, and, and, and that uh, during Ramadan, perhaps maybe where most people, I would dare say that in some instances 95% of the people around that community would be Muslims, many of whom would be fasting. So in order, not, in order to avoid being insensitive, to the religious demands of others, perhaps also in the exercise of one's own rights, it is helpful to be moderate, wouldn't it? Lead Council, I can understand what I will put across this point. This were harassment targeting a specific group and that's the Christian community. The Christians have their fasting period during Lent, they fast. If you have a law for the nation that it is because the Muslims are fasting at Ramadan, therefore apply that same law for the Christian when they are fasting during Lent, then it would have brought some understanding and people would not see it as personal attack. No, uh, I think on that one, on that one, that would be a bit of a mistake. Uh, it would depend on the religious needs of the group whose rights are being protected. If during Lent, it is not allowed during the Christ, in the Christian faith to be having music and dance, then perhaps you, would, you can say that uh, like should be treated with like, the same with like. Lead Council, it is the same. So in during, um, uh, during Lent, even dancing is being stopped and postponed, feast, celebration, like you're going to have an engagement or a wedding, you, you program it so that it doesn't fall during Lent. And the other non-Christians, they are not aware of it. They will eat and dance and play music during your Lent period. But perhaps if it was an order, an executive order from State House, banning it during Lent, then they would experience what the Christians have been going through. In a through. sense, you are saying it's discrimination. It is. Uh, you, you, what you are saying, essentially, it's not that the ban should not be 
imposed during Ramadan, your claim is if it is imposed during Ramadan, it must also be imposed during rent. Otherwise, there would be discrimination. If you find the need to ban something, there must be a good reason. And that reason is the basis of the discrimination. But for you, would it be okay, would, it be, would the problem be solved if the ban was extended to cover length period? It would have been tolerated. You but see, but what, how about for the Manjagos? Yes. The, the Manjagos would who, have... Who, especially those who do not subscribe to either the Christian or the Muslim faith. How about them? You would have to accommodate them if they have a concern for that. Um, they, they are having their m music. If the Christians are having their music during Ramadan and the Muslims are having their music during Lent, I see no reason why the Manjagos shouldn't have their music whilst they're having their funeral. Uh, I am all in, celebrate. I am, in fact, looking at the reverse. Mm -hmm. uh, imposing a ban to cover Lent period and to cover Ramadan period. If that is acceptable, how about the rights of the more or the much, much smaller minority which is the Manjagos who do not believe, or any other uh, religious group for that matter, who do not believe in Lent or in Ramadan. The way Gambians used to live was a perfect example of harmony, tolerance, understanding, and unity. People used to have Ramadan call it before Jame days, during the First Republic, and there was not this imposition of a ban? Why of a, all of a sudden you found the need during the Jama era? And as I said, these were a series of activities which were targeting a specific community continuously. Um, is it an importation, probably, of practices in the Middle East? Yes, I can understand that in Saudi Arabia, what they do, because it's a Muslim country, we don't do here, and yet this is a Muslim country. The difference being in Saudi, in Ramadan, whether you fast or you don't fast, you are supposed to fast, and if they f can um, confirm that you are not fasting, that would put you to trouble. You will be arrested. But How do they confirm that you are fasting? For instance, you eat in public. Of, it's therefore obvious that you are not fasting. Immediately that happens, you have no choice. You will be arrested. Now, these are the sort of practices being gradually imported and embedded into our own culture here, which is affecting the way we used to live. Saudi doesn't tolerate it, therefore Gambia shouldn't tolerate it. Our eyes are there. And it's a different culture. And the people who brought in all those ideas as I said, it started in the second administration, and we have a good track record of where it originated from and how far it's reaching into Gambian community. Could you tell us about that, where it originated and how far it has reached in Gambian culture? In 2014, in particular, Yaya Jame invited an Islamic scholar who is renowned for debates and renowned also for attacks on the Christian community. 
discrediting Christian values, Christian beliefs. He invited him into the Gambia in What's 2014. What's his name? Zaid Naib. Zaid. Zakir Naik. Zakir Naib was uh, the one invited. Uh, by, and that was the beginning of all this series of harassment which I was narrating, including the driving of a vehicle inside a procession. They all got the nerves from the visit of Zakir. Zakir came into the Gambia, made his preaching here, and claimed to be knowledgeable in Bible knowledge, and claimed that he even understood the Bible and he quoted more than the Pope. This we are not called for. What was the purpose of Zakir Naim? What was his theme of preaching in Gambian community here? Was it to come here and attack Christianity? It seems so. And until he had an incident with a bold Christian who put a stop to it and said, Zakir, please, you're going too far. Zakir, you claiming to be as, uh, knowledgeable in, in Bible, but you do not understand the Bible at all. You have wrong concepts. You misinterpret the Bible. And she tried to, to correct him and ask him questions in a public gathering. Zahid couldn't stomach that. At the end, he said, because you are a woman, I don't talk to a woman. And that was how the lady was ushered out. And whilst that was going on, President Yaya Yame was able to send a vehicle and an escort to take this girl home, rescue him from people who threatened her in the, in the hotel. And uh, uh, Yaya Yame was watching. In your book, in page 52, you indicated, you made a note that, in fact, in 2010, Canada denied Zakir entry, and he was also banned from entering the UK That's after arranging correct. to give talks in London and That's Sheffield. True. Do you, by any chance, have any idea why he was denied entry into these two countries? For the same reason. You know, statements propagating um, violence within communities, disruption within societies, creating intolerance among communities, religious intolerance. They saw this as okay, um, events leading to that. So, In a sense, you were saying he, he was propagating hatred and intolerance exactly. uh, among uh, different religious groups. That was why he was banned. And that was one of the reasons why he was even asked out of his own country of birth in he, India. Is he exiled from India? He was exiled from India, uh, sent uh, out. And, and your position, therefore, is that he should not have been invited into the Gambia to come and preach his toxic version of religion. Is that your testimony? That's right. If such a student whom you know even in his country of birth, they don't want him because of the same attitude. And Canada and UK refuse him entry. And Gambia honors him and gave him even a diplomatic passport and showered him with millions of dollars and gave him red carpet on arrival. To come and upset mm -hmm. the religious That's harmony right. that uh, we had in these Gambian the society. Type. So th th these were all events, one at a time. It has a cumulative effect. One can say, oh, Zahi, don't mind him. One can say, oh, um, a car driving a long procession, don't mind him, he is a crazy man. And other one will say, oh, he is the son of a reputable uh, businessman, uh, Basiru Jawara, don't mind him. 
Don't mind him, don't mind him. They added up. And it led to the situation where we found ourselves. Zakir, from Zakir, barely one year, December 15, 2015, Yaya made the declaration. That's the effect that they all have. And what was that declaration? He was proud to say that he was declaring Gambia an Islamic state. And people were confused when I say people across the board, people of all faith, because this was a Gambia that was practicing secular state, that is all people lived in harmony here, nobody interfering with the other. All of a sudden, you have declared it now an Islamic state, and it led to confusion. I can remember even the churches had to write, the bishops had to write to, to, to uh, Yaya, asking, what do you mean this? What is the implication of this? Uh, in uh, the preface to your book, uh, page 18, uh, could you read the last paragraph uh, up to page 19, uh, uh, the second to last paragraph? The primary reason for writing this book, therefore, no, no, page 18, page 18. The last paragraph? Yes. The, the Burfoot Proclamation of 10 December 2015, declaring that the Gambia would become an Islamic state, was the singular most dramatic, dramatic act of President Yaya A. J. J. Jame. Uh, uh, Mr. Sen, could you uh, slow down a bit? Because we have interpreters who are interpreting what you're saying. Thank you, you very much. You know, I didn't realize they were <laughs> interpreters. <laughs> yes, I, I'm sorry it's, for that. It, it's simultaneous. I should have warned you yes. earlier. Now, uh, I read up to big paragraph, you said. Uh, the, read three paragraphs. One, two, three, okay. Yes. I will take it slower. But I will continue from here. Could you start again? Okay. The Burfoot Proclamation of 10th December 2015 declaring that the Gambia would become an Islamic state was the singular most dramatic act of President Yaya A.J.J. Jame. It brought about mixture of shock, excitement, and revolution in the nation. Revolution, you said? in the nation. Revolution in the nation. For well over a century, the relationships between peoples of all faiths and tribes in the Gambia have been peaceful and cordial. It is common knowledge that Gambian citizenry celebrate and enjoy each other's feasts and festivals. On the other hand, while Muslims treasure the possibility of an Islamic state and an extension of the jihad to the territory of the Gambia, Other Muslims ruled the intent and became vehemently opposed to any such transformation. Christians were concerned about matters of survival victimization and persecution and dreaded 
being relegated to becoming second class citizens. From the constitutional standpoint, the IS proclamation was illegal. It was in opposition to the dreams and aspiration of the founding fathers of the modern nation state of the Gambia, who had penned their legacy to us in the national anthem, which reads, let justice guide our actions towards the common good and join our, our diverse peoples to prove man's brotherhood. That's it, the paragraph. Uh, since the IS declaration, proceed. Since the IS declaration, many observers have noted the gradual but definitive erosion of constitutional guarantees, the deterioration of secularism, democracy, and human rights in the Gambia. A vociferous reaction came through various social media platforms from several Gambians of all tribal and religious persuasions, especially those in the diaspora in the United States of America and in the United Kingdom. They were unrelenting in their demand for, poti for political change now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there are uh, quite a number of issues on this that we need to discuss. Uh, first, let's look at the impact of the declaration, uh, how it has affected the rights of people who espoused faiths that were different from the Islamic faith. Uh, let's, let's talk about that. Uh, and this would give also, this would lead also to the discussion of the wearing of headscarf by civil servants uh, and, uh, and other matters. So tell us what were the, what were the effects of this declaration on the exercise mm -hmm. of your Christian faith? One needs to make a connection, starting from Zakir making that visit and those public lectures, and uh, Yaya making the declaration in 2015. And what is the connection? Uh, soon after Yaya's declaration, he further promised to make, to remove the constitution of the Gambia and to bring Sharia law. So these were the three that did we are Did he connected. ever make that pronouncement? Yes. Yes, he uh, did. He promised. When did he make that pronouncement? Um, it was when the Christian community were nervous and seeking clearance from him as to what does this all mean. And he said, in very short words, this is final. And I will bring Islamic Sharia law here. Very simple language, very short. And they persisted to have a dialogue to meet him. I can remember in one time he said he couldn't see anybody. And what was the reason, he said, because in Ramadan, I don't entertain such visits. A head of state being requested for audience, and even those audience involve a, a representative 
of a foreign state, the Pope's emissary in the Gambia, who was representing Vatican City, which is a sovereign state for the West Africa, he was to make a visit with all this, including the Hanafals, including Reverend uh, Bishop Odiko and Ellison. He persisted, he refused to meet any of them and said, my decision is final. Uh, in your book, in page 25, we will come back to that decision. Uh, you, you captured, uh, the, in a sense, what the declaration entailed. Uh, that's paragraph one of page 25. Could you tell us, could you uh, recast that for us, please? And these were his words. As from today, the Gambia is an Islamic republic, noting that the majority of Gambians are Muslims. He declared an Islamic republic which would uphold its, its Islamic identity and respect. Accepting the Islamic religion, he continued, I'm still quoting him, accepting the Islamic religion as your religion and a way of life is not negotiable. We will respect the rights of all citizens. This does not mean that the Christians will not practice their religion. You, the Muslims, worship according to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, and let the Christians worship the way they do. I am not appointing, and this is very important, maybe not to Gambians, but people who live outside, they would know where he is heading to. I am not appointing any Islamic policeman. Yaya further emphasized the need for tolerance and mutual respect. He said that idol worshiping would not be allowed in the country. Uh, that he tried to walk a very tight rope in this pronouncement as captured in page 25 of your book. He tried to be very careful, even though uh, it went very far in some areas. He attempted to work a neat balance in, in view of the various sensitivities that may be involved in yes, this statement. I, I can see that, but that attempt to balance came after a firm, unacceptable, very strong statement. The statement was already made. And let's, let's, let's take them one by one. The first thing is the act of the declaration mm -hmm. of the Gambia as an Islamic state. Mm -hmm. so, can you tell us what is your complaint about that? Um, he said, um, this does not mean, is that where you want me to go? Uh, no, I want to take it step by step. Yeah. The Gambia in, is an in, Islamic in, in, republic. In page 18, oh, page you said 18. the declaration itself was the singular most dramatic act of President Yaya Jame. Yes. Yeah. Why do you say so? Why do you say, what is the problem with the declaration? What is your complaint about the declaration? You are the one testifying. I want these things to come out from you. That we are deviating from the normal practice. What used to be will cease to be. And that's the peak of it. Wouldn't you see in that act itself, the question of arrogating to oneself 
an authority that he did not have. It is there throughout, and that is one of the characteristics of former President Jame. No, it is in fact a characteristic of a dictatorship. Correct. Uh, whereby the pronouncement of a leader becomes law. That's correct. And uh, you are therefore saying that he exercised dictatorial power by suddenly, out of the blue, proclaiming the country to be a country that embraced and espoused and represents and enforced and implement a particular religion. This is exactly what he did. That aside, the act itself is prohibited or was prohibited by the Constitution, wasn't it? Yes, sir. But was it seen in that light by the Christian community that this, in fact, was unconstitutional? Yes, and it was argued even in public gathering, seminars, workshop, that that declaration is anti the Constitution. Was it, what did the Christian community do to, to vindicate their constitutional rights? We're not talking about the religious rights yet, we're talking about the constitutional rights. Yes. Um, the Christian community was aware of the fact that they had little or no powers other than challenging it verbally, they realized that they had no powers in the courts, in the judiciary. They had no powers in the military. They had no powers in terms of population proportion. So in all areas, they lacked sufficient powers to take up the challenge. But what do you mean by you did not have powers in the judiciary? Uh, are you suggesting that there was no equality before the law? There was none. There was none. Why do you say that? Because even as it unfolded, the declaration was being imposed onto the National Assembly. The National Assembly had a document to sign and one of the parliamentarians said that she wouldn't sign it because it had the, um, the letterhead, Gambia is an Islamic state. And that initiative even failed. So Yahya had all the powers at that time, even though it was challenged. And the inscription in public um, places, Gambia is an Islamic state, the Ministry of Interior was one of the last ones to remove their um, notice uh, signpost with those messages. So, the, it and was, what were those messages? The Repub Islamic Republic of the Gambia. So, in a sense, written. in a sense, you telling us that by merely making that pronouncement that the Gambia would become an Islamic Republic. State institutions began to enforce that as if the laws of the country did say that the Gambia was an Islamic Republic. It was, and all events that occurred in sequence pointed at that, not only the state um, institutions. Immediately after he made the declaration, we had Muslim elders of Banjul. Why Banjul? Why not the Gambia? But it was Banjul. Maybe they were closest to him. They made a visit to him to congratulate him for that declaration. So we got an acknowledgement coming from one sector of society. And these were the people you intend to fight against. Even immediately after that visit to State House, 
you had the first Gambia National Islamic Conference, which was organized at the Islamic Council. Uh, let's take it step by step. Uh, you said that soon after the declaration, at this page 25 of your book, that uh, Islamic elders, uh, including the Supreme Islamic Council, uh, and Banjul Muslim elders uh, made a solidarity visit to the president at State House in support of his declaration. Yes, they did. That was the one I'm referring to. Now, could you identify the problem with this? It is an endorsement of the declaration. Not only that, but why, why do you find it offensive? Why do you find that uh, this move was wrong? Why do you think this move was wrong? I thought these were people that were with me personally. We grew up in Banjul together. We socialized together. We chatted together. We having parties together. The imam and the bishop having meal together, meeting at functions together. The American ambassador would organize annual dinner and invite the two leaders at table. And all of a sudden, you've seen a portion of that group now saying, oh, yeah, yeah well done we should move towards Islamization of this country. This is what it means to me. In a sense, your complaint is that they are endorsing what you view as an unconstitutional act. Exactly. An illegality. That's it. Now, if all these things could happen, for sure the Christian community knew the limitation of what they could do. Uh, but uh, that aside, that aside, the actions of the Christian community, and we will come back to that. Uh, the move by Jaime was not necessarily endorsed by all Gambians. You, would you agree? I would agree, not all Gambians. And in your book, still on page 25, you did say that many eminent Muslims, including renowned politicians like Khalifa Salah, O.J. Jalo, and Dr. Aisha Tissure, expressed disagreement with the declaration and made suggestions to the Christian community for the way forward. Sure. This showed that not, is it coming? This showed that not all Gambians we are in agreement with the declaration. Neither, not all Muslims, we are in agreement with the um, pronouncement. And these three people I have just selected are prominent individuals. They are just to give you an example. They happen to be prominent Gambians, prominent Gambian Muslims, who from the onset, stood up and said this is wrong. But you would appreciate that this violation is bigger than a violation of the rights of the Christians. It was equally a violation of the rights of the Muslims because uh, there was no referendum to enable the Gambian public to decide whether they wanted a state being governed under Islamic law, or they wanted a state that is secular, or they wanted a state that is silent about the issue of religion and leaves it to the people. I agree that violation of a group, a minority group, can be seen as violation of the entire nation, because that minority group is within the nation. And this has also demonstrated the special features of the Gambia, unique only in the Gambia. It is in the Gambia where I can stand as one individual Christian and have nine Muslims surrounding me 
brother to brother. And they're able to stand up despite all odds. They will be with you. So you, yes, you're targeting a minority, but eventually when you look at it, it is a majority you are targeting because they are all one. You can recall that it was during this period that Father Edo, the renowned Catholic priest, used to feature in mass communication, mass media, saying the Gambia is one. You cannot come and say Islamic and non-Islamic. We don't see that. We see Gambia as one. It is Kang killing until at the end that became his name, Kang killing. So it is one, one minority you thought you were affecting, but it happens to be a majority because they are interrelated, interconnected. The connection of people in the Gambia is intricate, very delicate, and has gone very deep. The people who influenced Yaya, Zakir Naib, he was the one who came first, all his pronouncement, Yaya followed and made similar pronouncement because we are the, the majority. That was what Zakir was preaching here. They follow each other. In fact, I would say Yaya became a disciple of Zakir, following his footsteps with a firm belief. Even the bitter criticism that Zakir would do unto the Christians, Yaya did in Birkama. Same pattern. Well, we would come to that, uh, what Yaya said about Christians in Birkama. Uh, but step by step, after the declaration, the Christian community did not challenge its legality in court. N no. They, they, they resorted to a bigger weapon which they had. Which was what? Community cohesion. Every Christian here is tightly linked with a Muslim. So they use that factor, that community cohesion. Number two, prayers. All that you do if you pray and God grants, nobody can deny you. So they use these two. And in addition, of course, they used diplomacy. Um, uh, the Christian groups made various representations to President Jame. Correct? Um, the representation that we are initiated by the Christian community, we are all turned down by Yaya Jame. He never honored one initiative. In fact, in page 31 of your book, uh, you reproduced a letter uh, written by State House, by Office of the President, in response to your requests mm -hmm. for clarification. And... Uh, the, the letter written by State House was addressed to Most Reverend Hanafal Hain, uh, that's the Bishop of the Methodist Church, uh, Robert P. Ellison, Bishop of Banjul, and uh, is this Monsignor, I think, James Odiko, Bishop elect of the Anglican Church, and uh, Paragraph two of the letter reads as follows. I am to further inform you. No, I will start from paragraph one. And it reads as follows. I write on the directive of His Excellency the President, Sheikh Professor al Haji Dr. Yahya A.J.J. Jame Babili Mansa to acknowledge receipt of your letter dated uh, 25th December 2015, seeking clarification 
on the significance of His Excellency's declaration of the Gambia as an Islamic State. I am to further inform you that His Excellency, the President's declaration, was very clear and final. The declaration guarantees continuation of the freedom of religion and the culture of religious tolerance, as well as mutual respect between peoples of different faiths. A similar situation obtains in Egypt, Syria, Palestine, and Mauritania, where, like the Gambia, the Muslim majority coexist peacefully with the Christian community. Thus, your fears that Christians will be intimidated and your practice of Christianity put at risk under the news dispensation should be allayed. The perception informed by misinterpretations of His Excellency the President's declaration. Indeed, on the side of government, the cordial relations that have been forged between government and the Christian community will be preserved, and government expects the Christian community to do likewise. Whilst wishing you a happy and prosperous new year, please accept the assurances of His Excellency's highest consideration. That was the letter dated 11 January 2016, correct? Suleiman Samba, yes. Signed by Suleiman Samba, Secretary General. Yes. Interesting things to be gleaned from this letter. Uh, uh, that uh, the rights of the Christians would not be affected. Was that enough assuation? Oh, no. or was that enough reassurance oh, no. of the Christians' community? Not the least. It's near. It's not halfway. It's not even quarter way. It, it done, it's done nothing. Uh, All the examples narrated, uh -huh. what we see there is what we fear happening here. Uh, he uh, said Egypt. But let's start it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. The first important thing is the unilateral declaration of, of Islamic State. That is by itself offensive to you. Exactly. The unilateral declaration of Yes, it. yes. The second thing is the unconstitutionality. That's true of the act itself. You agree with that? That's true. And the third is the appropriation of authority or the arrogation of authority to himself, which he did not have. That's true. So it did not matter whether it's a declaration of Islamic State or something else, but the fact that you have a president who arrogated to himself a power that is not given to him by the Constitution, that by itself is offensive. I will agree that he was a typical dictator. He took all powers and he would do anything. But it is hand and glove. Yaya was motivated by Islamic fundamentalists. So we would come to Zahir all. motivated. We would come to He all. was a tool of Zahir. Uh, uh, what I am trying to do is to list all the things you found offensive in that singular, most dramatic act. As I you agree call with it. the list given. So, unconstitutionality, uh, ultra virus, that is uh, arrogating to himself power he did not have. Uh, those are two important issues here. Uh, the third is cementing a dictatorship because he is, in fact, by doing that, he was strengthening the dictatorship. Uh, and then the fourth one is the, the attacking the rights of Christians in, in, in Gambian community. You agree that those are four fundamental violations? I do agree. Right. Uh, so you are not, you are not impressed by the statement in his letter that the declaration guarantees continuation of the freedom of religion 
and the culture of religious tolerance as well as mutual respect between peoples of different faiths? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. But in addition to this, the president gave about $1 million to the Christian community. How did you view that? Um, Ex-President Yaya used funds from Allah to get his way through. All that money he gave was to solidify his position, to make him, make people see him as somebody benevolent. He's so kind and merciful as even the vice president then was proclaiming. You know, sir, your, your excellency is a nice man, he's a kind man, he's a kind-hearted man. We heard all these things, and that was the uh, why he was using that money. The money enabled him to give us that image. Not even that million. He even patronized pilgrimages. And in, uh, in one Easter, he gave $2.3 million. Yes, I can recall that it was controversial because that money was presented and the Catholic community confronted the bishop and said, your lordship, you shouldn't have taken this from Yaya. And the bishop said he was not aware. He didn't know that it would come to that. They went for something else, and all of a sudden, they saw a camera and people giving money, and they took in pictures. And they were all shocked. They were taken by surprise. Then the people said, if that should happen in the future, don't take any money from him. And if you are embarrassed that you must take this money, please, as soon as you receive it, organize a public gathering and redistribute that money to the people who needed it most. Did you consider that as a bribe to the leaders of the Christian faith? The, yes, and that was why it was being rejected. Don't take it. And hence, it was already taken without them being knowing. It was a surprise. And to make it look better, they call the charitable organization, philanthropics and hospitals doing treatment here, um, the Charity Sisters Hospital, which has an orphanage in Bakote. They call all of them, St. Vincent de Ball, that gives food and clothing and shelter to the poor and needy of the Gambia. They call all these institutions and distributed that money to say case close. And in future, we will not take, and even if we are compelled to take, we will repeat the same thing, give it to the people who need it most. So what? In spite of all this, uh, you did not accept the declaration, and uh, Jame did not change his position. That is correct, too. And uh, various communities within the Christian faith wrote representations, either publicly or directly to Jame, requesting that this position be changed and he listened to none of them. Uh, but let's look at uh, those who made the representations. Could you tell us? Could you tell us those groups that made representation? Um, the Knights of St. Peter and Paul, Gambia. 
And what does that mean, Knights of St. Peter and St. Paul? These are uh, group of Catholic elders form an organization, call it a society, an order, fraternal what, order. What type of fraternal order or fraternity order? They come is, it, is it a lodge or something? No, it's, it's a society that promotes the activities of the church. They are answerable to the bishop, who is also answerable to the pope. So they give support to the bishop in all his efforts because they are elders and highly respected. They come together, they have a strong force to do things that ordinary would, would be difficult. So they came together and made their position clear to the nation. And they gave reasons for those positions. As soon as they did that, it's wildfire. Other organizations, institutions belonging to the Catholic or the Christian community emulated and started doing the same thing. Uh, of course, in your book, you have captured the letter written by the Knights of St. Peter and St. Paul yes. in protest of the declaration. Yes. Which other groups wrote? Catholic Community of Atlanta. The, the Gambian Catholic, Catholic community, community in Atlanta. In Atlanta. And Washington, D.C. as yes, well? Yes, yeah, that's right. Okay. And uh, the various churches also wrote? The, the various, that was local here. Okay, all right. And, and Jame refused Jame to budge. And uh, what were the tangible effects of the declaration of Gambia as an Islamic state on the Christians? It unified the church, greater unity. They saw the need to come together to confront Yaya Jame. So it facilitated Christian unity in the Gambia. But let's talk about the steps that were taken by government to actually implement uh, the declaration and how has that affected the exercise of your faith as Christians? Could you, could you talk about that? What were the tangible steps taken to implement the, the, the new fatwa by Yaya Jame that uh, the Gambia is now an Islamic state? Um, Mr. Chair looks surprised and shocked. <laughs> there is no other way of putting it other than other than that, it's a declaration making Gambia an Islamic state. Could it be called a fatwa? That is what it would sound in the Islamic world. But yes, uh, yes. yes the declaration. What does? What steps yes. were taken to? to actually enforce its implementation. He, he called up the, this meeting, which was the first Gambia National Islamic Conference, and the directives were very clear. He urged them 
to find ways of implementing this declaration. That was the sole objective. And it featured well at the meeting. They presented papers. And some of the people who were there who made presentation included Omar Ja, Dr. Ja, whom we hear his name very often nowadays. Yaya pushed his way and um, I think it coincided with the effort that the Gambians in the diaspora we are making and the approaching elections with diverted attention. You say, okay, election is not very far. Why don't we make sure that we vote him out and we'll be out of all this grip? And the Gambians, inside and outside, had similar vision. They tried to mobilize a unity, a coalition, which they almost imposed onto the signatories of the coalition, because not everybody at that time was willing to come up to this coalition, either because of fear or no hope that it would ever succeed. So all efforts went in, and um, they all became foot soldiers in the country. The Christians, the Muslim friends of the Christians in the Gambia, the schoolmates and classmates of those Christians in the Gambia had their meetings here, and had their strategy. And they were in the forefront trying to convince the signatories to come and sign for that coalition because there was no agreement until eventually there was. Yeah, Mr. Chair, it's five minutes past the uh, regular break period. Perhaps we should leave it at that. Uh, take the second break as the chair wishes. Thank you very much, Chairman Council, and uh, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Sain. We will take a one-hour break and uh, uh, come back at uh, 2.35. Uh, Council, I would um, uh, uh, consult you or talk to you on fatwa and uh, see what it is. I, I thought there were you had declarations, you had decrees, you had pronouncements, and now fatwa has been added to that under the new Islamic um, uh, Republic. If it that sounded is the case, very you would much like... To, I withdraw that the use of that word. <laughs> it just sounded very much like that. Mr. Thank you. We Thank take, you very much. We'll take a one-hour break. 2.35, we, we come back. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. I have a meeting.